any more we ought to start. Um, I was thinking of what exactly, or how exactly, to either welcome or describe Savoy, and it really kind of seemed um, fairly pointless. I read through some of the stuff that other people got off the internet. Um, there were some particularly kind of mad bits. Um, it, it was a bit about, in the last 20 years, participation at over 350 international philosophical, psychoanalytical, and cultural criticism symposia in the USA, France, United Kingdom, Ireland, Germany, Belgium, Netherlands, Ireland, Austria, Australia, Switzerland, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, Spain, Brazil, Mexico, Israel, Romania, Hungary, and Japan. Uh, we obviously put on the planet to kind of embody the frequent fires kind of miles program. Um, there really is no need here uh, to do anything by way of introduction except to welcome uh, Slavoj back, who was here, I think, about eight years ago uh, to speak um, in a small conference on the domestic, uh, for which he gave a paper on radical evil. Um, but that turned out fine. Um, the only safe way, I think, uh, to begin it is simply to say um, that Slavoj is, and he will talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much, and especially Mark for this kind of introduction, because I have especially fond memories of this place for a very specific reason. I don't know if you remember, but there was a journalist here, a lady that time, eight years ago, from some architectural journal. And then she wrote a report on the talk, which cost me, but I laughed at it, an immense amount of trouble in my country, Slovenia. I was attacked as non, non patriotic and so on. You know why? Because uh, I spoke, as you said, about it was canny, uncanny home about radical evil. And you know, this lady, and I loved it because it was typical how this politically correct sympathy with victims was revealed as patronizing racism. She wrote, and this was then reproduced in the main Slovene daily newspaper on the front page, a small item, but on the front page. She wrote, she com oh, to cut a long story short, she confused the names of my hometown, Ljubljana, and Lubyanka. You know, the KGB torture prison in Moscow. And they said, no wonder for him uh, the home is radical evil when he was living there in the very torture house of KGB and so on. So that's my first memory of this place for which I'm grateful. The, the second memory is, uh, this will be a kind of an ongoing dialogue, or I would have put it, as I would have put it in much more innocent terms, class struggle between me and Mark, because we are both Hitchcockians. We both think that one of the two Hitchcock masterpieces is, I mean, to cut the crap, the, the biggest movie of all times. There is only a small difference, but as you know, among Stalinists, the smaller the difference, more vulnerable. He thinks it's vertigo, I think it's psycho, no? But, so, uh, but today, to annoy him, because I know that he published a wonderful essay on psycho, sorry, on vertigo. <laughs> I cannot even do it, okay. I, I, will I will mostly speak about vertigo, and not to be too boring, I hope that I can presuppose, presume that most of you have seen the movie, so that I don't have to go into all these details. Okay, so let me then begin. Uh, whenever I read about a Hitchcock film or see it, something always strikes me. One of the most instructive things to do about, especially these two masterpieces, Vertigo of Psycho by Hitchcock, is to play the game of mental experiments. What if things were to take just a slightly different path, as they almost did? For example, in Psycho, what if, did you know, of course you all know Psycho, did you know that there was already a score written, a totally different score by Bernard Herrmann, more in his jazz style as he did it later for Taxi Driver, uh, with saxophone jazz, I, I mean, 
it's strange to imagine what kind of a movie this would be because now we identify so much psycho with these strings only score. Or uh, what would have happened if in Vertigo, if instead of Kim Novak, we would get Vera Miles, who, as maybe you know, she was already, she was supposed to get the role and it was a simple accident, she got pregnant. And then Kim Novak was the second choice. An even more ultimate obscenity to insult you, Mark, that would be for you. Do you know that there already was written by this uh, bestseller uh, couple, uh, Livingstone Evans, a song, Vertigo, which the studio wanted to impose on Hitchcock during the titles. With this kind of idiotic words like, oh, I will draw you in vertigo of my love and so on and so on. So just let's just try to imagine what would have happened. A more, more crucial, serious question is that, I don't know if you know, but in the original scenario on Vertigo, there is another half a minute scene at the end, which Hitchcock shot, but basically he was cheating. He shot it just to dupe the censorship, and then he dropped it out, but from the beginning, probably he planned to drop it out. Because if you know Vertigo, you probably know that it violates Hayes code in the sense that the criminal, Gavin Elster, the, the bad guy, the murderer, sorry, the, the husband of Madeleine, he isn't caught, he just disappears. So the last, there was in the original version, not, not released, but for the studio bosses, a 30 second sequence where you see Scotty back at home with me and uh, you know, these magic moments in cinema, when, whenever you open a radio, it's just the news that concerns you. They open a radio and then the voice says, the criminal Gavin Elster was caught in Switzerland or somewhere else for, and then they look at each other, blah, blah. So just how many are these possibilities? Uh, these mental experiments or alternate stories are often realized in what is, and this will be my starting point, one of the most revealing, although apparently trivial aspects of Hitchcock studies, the extraordinary amount of simple factual mistakes. It's already well known that in cinema studies, there is an extraordinary amount of factual mistakes. Like even there is a famous saying, maybe you know it by Stanley Cowell, who proudly says, no, I stand by all my mistakes and so on. No? He meant that apropos of these melodramas, uh, melodramas of the unknown woman, but especially with Hitchcock. It, this reaches dimensions of madness sometimes, like the recently, he died unfortunately recently, Raymond Durgna, the British guy, who just before his death, his last book was, I think, uh, uh, something like a really close look at Psycho, a wonderful, literally shot by shot study of Psycho. But okay, in his standard Hitchcock book, The Strange Case of Alfred Hitchcock, there is a 40 pages analysis of vertigo, detailed analysis, 40 pages. But the premise of it is, it all the time describes it as if the movie takes place in Los Angeles. I mean, it's, you know, if there ever was a movie identified with a place, it's of course vertigo and San Francisco. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that there are so many of these mistakes that I'm almost tempted to see something redemptive in them. That because the first surprise is the nature of these mistakes. They are often, this, the case of Durgnat and Vertigo is not typical. Typically, they are detailed mistakes, and typically, they are crucial for the line of argumentation. It's usually when you are in for a mistake, you should always be careful when you read an analysis of Hitchcock and when the author said, but here we should pay very careful attention to the exchange of point of view and objective thoughts or she recalled that cut and so on and so on. And then surprised you, I don't know, buy a video or a DVD, check it up. It simply isn't there. It's different. So this, and again, the interesting point is that it's at its most engaged. Precisely, it's not indifferent interpreters who commit this kind of mistakes, misreading. It's precisely the most engaged readers. And I think that often, again, these mistakes are in a way productive, they point towards a repressed dimension or whatever. So uh, now I would like to start with such a mistake, pointed out by a guy who was previously unknown to me, Joe Eskenazi. I hope I pronounce it right, uh, of Hungarian origins, who works in France at CNRS. 
nothing to do with my private gang of theories, psychoanalysis, just a good cognitivist, but he wrote a, a wonderful, in French only, a wonderful detailed study of vertigo recently. And it's incredible. You would have thought, my God, everything is, was possible, was already written about vertigo. No, it wasn't. His starting point, it's a wonderful, simple observation about two of such systematic mistakes. They occur one minute from one after the other, and practically everybody, he gives, it's almost like McCarthy naming names, he gives the list there, Laura, name it, Laura, he claims, I didn't double check it, Laura Malvi, Robin Wood, just three, four even, everybody committed a mistake here. So please, the first clip. It's the scene in Ernest, the restaurant, where Scotty sees for the first time Madeleine. So you see, he is, could you take it a little bit louder, maybe, the sound? You see, so now, he is there on the side. So this, what we see now, cannot be his point of view shot. Everybody describes this, I will try to explain why, as the first mistake, as his point of view shot. Of course, it's tracking shot, you have there the fascinum, and then you see that's her. After this shot, you have now sub, uh, the classical suture procedure, subjective objective shot. We go on. Now comes one of the most famous shot profile of Madeleine. Look how artificially lightened is even the background, more yellow. Again, again, practically every, and now after this strange shot, the profile, now only you have, this is subjective shot. This is the classical future procedure, subjective, objective. Stop. You can go. Uh, now, uh, again, what is so mysterious here is that practically everybody describes these two shots to which I draw your attention, especially the second one, this profile, as, uh, as Scottish, James Stewart's point of view subjective shot. But if you look at it closely, it's not. He is precisely too afraid to confront it. He just, he, he, is, he is afraid of. So what we have here is what? It's a sh shot of Madeleine, this profile, which is not Scottish point of view. The shot of her profile is, while not his point of view shot, it is totally subjectivized. It does depict, in a way, not what Scotty effectively sees, but what he imagines, his hallucinatory inner vision. It's really a fantasy shot. Remember, he even played with this, how the red background on the wall even gets yellow, like burning fire and so on. So the point is that uh, this profile, which almost threatens to explode, red heat turning into a yellow blaze, as if Scottish passion is directly inscribed into the background. It is as if precisely by not looking directly at it, it is as if he, Scotty, is libidinally captivated by it. It's too strong. It's, you got my point, it's a phenomenon, it is subjective, but it's, how to put it, a subjective phenomenon, but too intense to be directly assumed by a gaze. It would be too much. And what then happens in a very nice way is how af only after she, uh, Madeleine, moves back towards the door, it is as if only when the object of desire is not too close to burn you, only at that point he can afford to look at her and you get what was described by hundreds of persons as a uh, future procedure takes place. That is uh, this classical exchange of subjective and objective shots. So again, what we get in these two shots, especially in that profile shot, is a shot which is subjectivized without being attributed to a subject, a kind of pure pre-subjective phenomenon. It's a pure appearance, too subjective, too intense to be assumed by the subject. 
And we get, again, the same movement from the excess of subjectivity without subject to the standard future procedure, the exchange of objective and subjective point of view shots. This excess is thus domesticated with the future procedure. It's rendered, transformed into part of the, uh, of, of the standard subject-object exchange. And it is in order to erase the intensity of this subjectless subjective shot that I think the large majority of interpreters from Donald Scotto to Robin Wood and so on strangely insist in their detailed description of this scene that the shot is Scottish point of view shot. In this way, the excess is contained within the logic of future. So this, I found a nice irony here, how the very theorists who decry, uh, uh, who, you know, 20 years ago, it was still fashionable to refer to future as the basic ideological matrix procedure of, of, of cinema, how they themselves enact precisely this operation here. They kind of uh, retranslate the excess back into the logic of future. Uh, what we encounter in these excesses is precisely, in the Lacanian jargon, the gaze as object free from the, the gaze, free from the strings which attach it to a particular subject. No wonder that so-called Kino Eye, Kino Glass, Giga Vertox, Soviet silent classic from 1924, takes as its emblem precisely the eye of the camera as an autonomous organ which wanders around in the Soviet Union of the early 20s. Recall here the common expression but it works better in French. I think also in English you can say to cast an eye over something. But the French have the expression jeter l'oeil, which means literally to throw an eye. And I cannot but recall here there is a wonderful French uh, 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 fairy tale, uh, comic one about uh, Martin, Martin, the legendary idiot who being an ugly boy, cannot find a girlfriend, so his mother tells him, why don't you go to a church on Sunday and jetele, and throw your eye around. So he goes first to a butcher, buys some pig's eyes, and go to a church and throws them around, and then comes to mother and say, look, mother, it didn't get me. No girl loved me for doing that, and so on, and so on. But that's what we should do, I claim. Uh, a quote from Berto. The film camera drags the eyes of the audience from the hands to the feet, from the feet to the eyes, and so on, in the most profitable order, and it organizes the details into a regular montage exercise, and so on, and so on. So what would be this gaze which is stolen from us, turned into an organ without a body? We all know the uncanny moments in our everyday lives when we catch sight of our own image, and this image is not looking back at us. I myself remember once trying to inspect a strange growth on the side of my head using a double mirror. You know, like you can sometimes see yourself from the side. And when all of a sudden I caught a glimpse of my face from profile through this double mirroring. And the image replicated all my gestures, but in a weird, uncoordinated way. It, in such a situation, my specular image was stolen from me. My look was no longer looking back at me. It is in such weird experiences that you catch what Lacan called gaze as the object small a, at its purest, the part of our image which eludes the mirror-like metrical uh, relationship. So when we see ourselves from outside, from this impossible point, the traumatic feature is not that I am objectivized, reduced to an external object for the gaze, but rather that it is my gaze itself which is objectivized, which observes me from outside. Uh, someone close to me had a couple of years ago an operation, and uh, it must have been a traumatic thing. The operation was, I don't know, some smaller operation, so it was only local anesthesia, but as parts of it, and I still don't know, was this justified or was just a specific doctor's sadism? It was that while under anesthesia, the eye was taken out only under anesthesia. And the person told me that it was nightmarish, not pain. There was no pain. But because the eye was taken out and turned around a little bit. So it was possible, you know, it was like divine position. You can look at yourself objectively. This is the heart. 
okay. So uh, let's now go on. So what exactly is the status of this case? Where do we find it? There is uh, a wo another wonderful detail in vertigo, which often passes unnoticed, a detail which tells us a lot about how censorship works, at whom censorship is targeted. There is a scene in Vertigo, you remember, after uh, Scotty saves Madeleine from the bay, he brings her to his apartment, and then puts her into bed, blah, blah, and then, okay, the idea is, of course, underlying the idea that he undressed her, because you see the movement of the camera across his apartment, and then above a scene, you see her underwear. But do you really see that? Everybody thinks that you do see that. But, and that's what I read in this book on Vertigo, that this was the biggest fight of Hitchcock with censorship. They didn't, uh, censorship insisted, the Hays Code guys, Hays office, sorry, that it should not be real underwear, really underwear, because then people may really think that he saw her naked. So please show it. Because everybody automatically assumes that it is underwear. You will see it is not. But you see the irrationality of it. Yeah. Just look carefully now. This will be very interesting. Look, it's not. Look, it's not. Even this, if you stop it and laugh at you see, and if you ask anyone, they will tell you it's underwear. And even, uh, stop, that's all, sorry. And that's her, yes. That's the logical conclusion. After uh, 10 minutes later, when she leaves the room, that this piece of cloth disappears. So automatically you think it is. Now, why am I showing you this? Not just to make fun of, but to ask a simple question. About whom was the censorship worried? Because it wasn't to protect us viewers. We all automatically assume that we see underwear. Isn't this a very weird operation of censorship? It is as if it's not that they wanted to protect us, but they wanted precisely what Lacan called the big other. They wanted to protect some all-knowing view. They didn't want to protect us. We all, again, automatically assume that it is underwear. The, the, the history of censorship in Hitchcock is very instructive also, because in Psycho, you know which was the only big problem with censorship in Psycho? Not all the killings, not the shower murder, but towards the end, when boyfriend and sister, uh, uh, Lila and Sam, when they, in the cabin occupied previously by Marion, you remember when they look into the closet bowl for a brief split of a second? That was the big fight. And if you look at the shot, you will see it, because censorship insisted that, A, it should last just split of a second, that you really see the inside, and B, that it should be, this was the crazy insistence, absolutely clean. No traces of shit or whatever. No, again, why I find this interesting is that you can see how when Lacan talks about big other and so on, the other's gaze, this is not, this is not some fantasy, this is something which is my God. Hayes Code knew it, I mean, American censorship knows it. They, they were worried about that. So, uh, what this shows is the logic of belief. The point is not in the case of Vertigo that we should believe that there was no, uh, that, there, that he didn't see her naked. But the innocence to be protected is the innocence as it were of the big other. The belief to be protected is the belief of the big other. So again, my old thesis, when Lacan speaks about the big other, the big other is not so much this Hegelian cunning of reason substance, a divine-like entity which pulls all the strings secretly. It's almost rather the opposite. It's the power of pure appearance. The big other means appearance have to be maintained. And this maybe touches the topic of the book on account of which I'm here, my last book, The Puppet and the Dwarf, where I precisely develop this paradoxes of belief, belief as attributed to another. I rely here to the work of my good friend, young Austrian philosopher, Robert Faller, who developed, relying on people like Paul Vane, but at the same time with a critical distance, how today's notion of belief, this first person belief, I fully assume 
belief is something modern, is something which emerged with early modernity, probably. That, for example, when old Greeks spoke about Zeus and so on and so on, about the gods living on the top of the Mount Olympus, the point was not if you climb the mountain, you will see their gods. But nonetheless, in a way, they did believe. So Robert Thaler, this friend of mine, introduces here the notion of beliefs which are beliefs of no one. It's like that no one who is to be spared the horrible idea that James Stewart may have seen uh, Kim Novak naked and so on. It's just somebody, but a non-existing somebody. And the idea is, again, that this is how our beliefs function. When in a so-called, precisely, but it's not primitive, we are more primitive, primitive society, when people say we believe that our origin is that stupid totem bird or whatever fish, it's not that they believe in it. It's the big other which believes, which is why here I follow again my friend Robert Faller. He claims that uh, if anything, today we believe more than ever, because what we are not able today is precisely to sustain this belief through a distance, through a proxy. It must be personal belief. And here, I think he pulls a stroke of a genius, Robert Faller, where he uses as the ultimate proof of a totally believing attitude, so-called Derridean deconstructionism. Why? Ah, he gives some wonderful examples. Like he says, uh, what's the first thing that strikes the eye when you read? Now they're already a little bit uh, in decay. They no longer do it the way they did it some 10 years ago. These hardline deconstructionists are gone. The first feature is, as you may remember, this fear to state a thing directly. For example, a true hardline deconstructionist like, okay, the, okay, like I had a, recently a friendly fight with her, so I will use my good enemy friend, Judith Butler. Uh, she would never say this is a can of Coke. She would say, if we accept the phallogocentric referential functioning of language, so the if we strategically, that's the word he likes, if we strategically adopt this attitude, may we not perhaps, she likes, she loves rhetorical question, risk the hypothesis that this can be designated again, strategically, blah, blah, as a <laughs> can of coke and so on. But you see, you see what is wrong here? What is wrong here is the idea, is this fear to say directly, this is a can of coke. I claim what the constructionists don't see is that if you say it, if I say it directly, this is a can of coke, I mean exactly the same as all those providers. You don't need them, because this is precisely what pre-modern people uh, meant. All this was included, or it's the same with love. Umberto Eco made somewhere a wonderful, ironic, uh, 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 in one of his early good journalistic, uh, uh, you know who is Umberto Eco, this good journalistic commentator who unfortunately engaged in novels which are much worse, and even more unfortunately in work, uh, engages sometimes in theoretical writings which are even worse. Okay, but okay, the good echo, the journalist, once wrote an essay on love today and claimed how today we find it too obscene to say, I love you. You must include, you must say, as a poet would have put it, I love you, or, you know, like, or maybe we could call this love or whatever. But again, the point is that before, as if traditional guys really meant it, the problem is, no, I mean, it, this distance that you have to mark as such today was simply included before. The mystery is why do we have to do it today? And I think that perhaps this strange attitude towards beliefs is why today the term culture emerged as the central life world category. Practically everything that we deal with is an object of cultural study. Science is a cultural phenomenon, art is a cultural phenomenon, uh, philosophy is just another cultural, even if you read radical structuralist or deconstructionist, production, critique of politi uh, political economy, capitalist, another cultural signifying phenomenon, and so on and so on. I think here a strange thesis. Why everything is culture? What does it ultimately mean, culture? Actually, like in the sense of really existing socialism, what is the really existing culture? It's a set of beliefs, practices, which we assume through this distance of this belief, I claim. If you really believe it's religion, 
it's culture, the moment you say, as for example, many of my Jewish friends, but not only Jewish, are saying, you know, I do respect kosher, I don't eat meat, blah, 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 import, but you know, it's just culture. I don't really believe in it. It's just out of respect. Culture is something that, as we put it, you don't take it seriously, but you respect it. Of course, you, like in this scene, the big other believes you don't want to hurt the big other. Now comes the ultimate paradox. So how do we call those poor guys who really believe in their culture? We call them barbaric fundamentalists. This is the definition of them. And this, I think, is what bothered us so much about my beloved Taliban, when you remember two years ago when they were bombing, bombing those Buddha statues, why were we, I think it was absolutely hypocritical, our Western reaction. Why were we so, so, so outraged? The, the superficial reason was, my God, it's part of, our, of, the, of the cultural, uh, car, uh, cultural treasures of humanity. How can they do this? No, I think this is not what bothered us. What bothered us is that they took religion so seriously. We found, we found it incredible that they really believed that those stupid, we really thought that these are just some stupid stone statues. We found it unbearable that they really saw in them some threat that religion really meant it for them. So again, I think that, okay, I cannot refrain from drawing the obvious pessimistic conclusion, which is that uh, maybe we with this culture, cultural studies attitude, we undermine religion much more effectively than all the Taliban guys. I mean, this is, for example, the lesson today my friends told me, maybe they told me only one side of the story in Tibet. Now, it's now that Tibetans are losing. When the Chinese, Chinese communists finally got it, forget about all the repression of the monks. No, you even give millions of dollars to, reno, to, to renovate the old Tibetan monasteries, but you just change the context. You have now already, uh, uh, Tibetan karaoke bars, their Lama experiences, and so on and so on, and the job is done much more efficiently. Okay, back to vertigo. At this point, the probable reaction of you will be, of course, this opposition, the opposition between the big other and the ordinary gaze, the all-seeing gaze of the big other and the ordinary gaze, is simply the platonic one. That between, between the limited view of us mortals and the view of the big other, which sees everything. And effectively, already in the late 50s, immediately after Vertigo's release, Eric Romer noted that the film is deeply platonic. However, I think the link is a negative one. Vertigo is the ultimate anti-platonic film, a kind of systematic undermining of the platonic project. In what sense? Let's be here very precise. The murderous fury that seizes Scotty when he finally discovers, you know, 10 minutes before the end, that Judy, whom he tried to make into Madeleine, is the woman he knew as Madeleine, is precisely the fury of a deceived platonist who perceives that the original he wants to imitate, to remake in a perfect copy, is already in itself a copy. This is pure platonic fury. The shock here is not, again, that the original turns out to be a mere copy. This is a standard deception, and uh, Plato all the time warns us against it. Don't mistake a copy for the original. The, uh, the, the shock is that what we took to be the copy turns out to be the original. That is to say that the Madeleine, which was supposed to be a copy, was already the original. Perhaps one should read here Vertigo together with uh, General Della Rovere, a wonderful Rossellini Roberto Rossellini, masterpiece from the same time, late 50s, the story of a small thief and swindler, so probably played by Vittorio De Sica, who is arrested by the Germans in Genoa in the winter of 44-45. The Germans, of, uh, occupying force in Italy, no, propose a deal to him. In the prison, he will pass for the legendary General Della Rovere, a resistance hero, so that other political prisoners will tell him their secrets especially the true identity of other key resistance leaders. However, the small thief, the Sika, played by the Sika, gets so intensely caught up in this role that at the end, he fully assumes the identity of General Della Rovere and he prefers to be shot as General Della Rovere. You know, he simply takes the game seriously. The platonic reversal to be accomplished here is the same as that of Vertigo. What if the true Della Rovere was already a fake? I think this would be a more intelligent twist. Of what, what if 
at the end, the true robbery would emerge and we would discover that the shika as the copy, the fake, is more true to it than, than as it were, the original, the original itself. So back to Vertigo. Crucial for the film's anti-platonic thrust are the deceivingly dead, because they are simply often perceived by idiots who don't know how to read a movie as kind of a dead 10 minutes uh, of the film. After Scotty meets Judy, let's say the poor girl who turns to be Madeleine, in the second half of the film, and before he fully engages in her violent transformation into Madeleine. What happens here? There are three, I will only show them, not to lose too much time, two of them. There are three key scenes here. First, the scene of their initial evening date at Ernie's again, with the couple seated at the table opposite each other, obviously failing to engage in a minimum conversation. All of a sudden, Scottish gaze gets fixed on some point behind Judy, the vulgar common girl sitting opposite him, and we see that it is a woman vaguely familiar to Madeleine, dressed in the same gray gown. When Judy notices what attracted Scottish gaze, she is, of course, deeply hurt. The crucial moment here is when we see, from Scottish point of view, the two of them in the same shot. Judy on the right side, close to him, and the gray woman back in the background. Could we have, please, now the next one, if you succeeded? And then, please, don't turn it back, just let it run. Because you see now, this is the same Ernest, this is the vulgar girl, Judith. You see, that. I think this is the pure platonic split. That is to say, the vulgar model, but then when it comes too close, he sees, and of course, she notices what, she notices what happened. What is crucial here is that you see at that brief moment of illusion, when Scotty thinks that, my God, what if that woman back there is Madeleine? Just let it run, let it, let it on, please. Uh, at that brief split of a second, we get the absolute appears. And this is, in what sense, Lacan repeated against Plato that what Plato didn't see is that the suprasensible absolute idea is appearance as appearance. The absolute is that brief vision is that the woman? But when it gets too close, it is dispelled. So again, here we have the platonic split in a way. The real woman who is vulgar copy and the brief illusory appearance of the absolute idea. Then he takes her home. And this is, I think, the ultimate feminist anti-platonic scene. This in itself is an absolute masterpiece. You will see what will happen now. You will literally see the negative of the profile that we saw in the first shot that I showed you at Ernest. You remember when you see Madeleine against the background. Here you will see the background is green. You will see her Judith profile, but only as dark. It's literally, that's why he uses her, just as a kind of a dark screen to project. This is literally the negative. This you should read again together with that one. And now comes something absolutely unthinkable, tremendous. This is the moment of subjectivization. Subject is not all this shot that you will see now, her face literally split. How it is as if it's ontologically incomplete. You can read this even as platonic horror, the black shape, that's the stuff, of course. And this, the stuff for men's dreams. It is as if you remember but I will tell you because this talk asks 5,000 for a simple talk. Okay, but that's another story. Okay, so I think again, okay, stop please. It's okay. I, I think that here you see that Hitchcock was a genius, how to put it, how precisely it works. Profile you see then, profile filling in this black and this tragic position, if you want, of feminine subjectivity. Something else happens then in the scene that I will not show you to take too much time, when uh, there is a scene 
soon after this one, when the two of them go dancing, and you can see in almost tragic way for her when they dance how she would want to be closer to him physically, but he he's really disgusted at her. He doesn't want her physically. He wants her just as that dark stuff to put together his fantasy. Uh, okay. So I think that it is okay, but you will say, but then at the end we do have coitus. Yes, but when? Only when he, Scotty, fills in that black half with again with fantasy of Madeleine. You remember when he re when he remakes her as Madeleine, then they make love implicitly. But that love is again <coughs> definitely masturbatory in its structure. It is like you know what Karl Kraus quoted by Freud said. Coitus is nur ein ungenügendes surrogat für die Onanie. Coitus is only an insufficient substitute for masturbation. No, that's basically uh, the structure which is there. And okay, then don't have time to go now into this more in detail. I would just like to emphasize that uh, this phallic dimension, masturbatory dimension of male enjoyment, jouissance, enables us to define in a precise way sexual possession. The ultimate formula of sexual possession is not the exploitation of the partner as a sexual object, but the renunciation of such use, the attitude of, I do not want anything from you, no sexual favors on conditions, on condition that you do not have any sex with others. I think that this pure, this is the true possession opposed to use. And I think that this is my solution to the standard Kantian problem but don't you, when you make love, don't you use the other as object for your pleasure? Yeah, but that's the risk you have to take. I think that the attitude of possession is precisely to reject this and then to, again, maintain the other just as an object of uh, possession. So again, we have this tension that we noticed here between two sides, tension embodied in the two sides of, of a woman, this woman, Judy Madeleine. Half of the woman, the subjectivity, feminine subjectivity, the real, the other half, the screen for projecting fantasies. This is this not also the overall structure of vertigo. That is to say, it's a well-known theory, and I think it works, according to which vertigo as a film plays upon two registers. On the one hand, it can be read as simply a realistic narrative, a story about taking place in the real world about a guy who blah, blah, blah. If you take everything that happens in the film as simply taking place in reality. But you know all these mental experiments, which I think are justified in this case, that you can, namely the alternate reading, which is, you remember how at the very beginning there is the famous scene of Scotty running from one roof to the other, and then we see him hanging down. And it's never explained how he got down. So the reading is that the entire film which follows is then just his, is that just uh, his fantasy, what happens before he fell down. And that at the end, it rejoins his situation when he is again on the top of the, of the church tower, so that what should have happened at the end is he jumps down and it's his jump in reality. All that really happens are the first uh, three minutes. Uh, so if we read the movie this way, the structure is the one of Ambrose Bierce's famous short story, An Occurrence at Old Creek Bridge, in which everything that follows the hanging of a man at the story's outset is at the end revealed as the fantasy of the dying man. There are also other films which play on this ambiguity, like Point Blank, John Borman's, you remember, with uh, Lee Marvin. At the beginning, Alcatraz, and you can read it as if at the beginning, he is shot and all because at the end you return to Alcatraz. As if it's just a kind of a fantasy detour. And I think that this idea of two levels is very, let's call them in a naive way, fantasy reality, is operative, effectively in Hitchcock. Why? This is the way to account for those mysterious moments where things, how to put it, happen just at the right moment. That is to say, something that if we only perceive the movie as taking place in reality would be a slightly ridiculous coincidence but nonetheless we take it seriously why because 
this is the point where, as it were, fantasy directly intervenes into reality. There are two such scenes. One is the very last scene. Do you remember how, when they practically already reconcile with each other at the very end on the tower, uh, Scotty and Judy, the girl, they embrace. At that very point, Mother Superior appears from below. And, but you know, the problem is here, the perfect timing. If Mother Superior were to appear two minutes earlier, nothing would have happened. If she were to appear 20 seconds earlier, nothing would have happened. And in a way, this works, because as I put in one of my books, I forgot which one, uh, uh, this is a serious option in the sense that I remember when I was young, when I was 13, 14, I saw for the first time Vertigo in my country, ex-Yugoslavia. It was in Cinematek. It was a bad old copy, so bad that the last half minute was missing. And for 10 years, I thought that Vertigo is a movie with a happy end. That they embrace, pardon, and so. And no, the shock is that it worked quite well. I mean, it is. So it's a serious question why does the mother superior have to appear? It's clear why. Because if Scott is super ego, Scott wants her death. It's almost the Orpheus like, you know, it's the version of, you know, we all know what really happens in Orpheus myth. No? Orpheus is terrified by the idea, this woman with me up there, where is my noble poetic profession? So it's clear that he turns back so that he goes back to hell and he can write poetry and so on. Okay. But then another, even nicer example of this magic coincidence in what is, I think, if you ask me, and I wonder, Mark, if you were to agree, like this gunpoint question, one scene from Vertigo, which is the top. If you ask me, it's that short scene after he saves her, just after that, uh, that uh, display of underwear, which is not underwear, when they have that gentle, soft conversation at the table, uh, when he then joins, sorry, she joins him from the bedroom and they have that conversation, short conversation. It's, it's their first conversation. This is the supreme scene. But again, you have this magic moment of intervention at precisely the right point. Now I will show you, okay, please, the last clip. It's a miracle that it worked. I mean, I was pessimist. Let's hope that it will work here also. Just vo if you can put some voice on now, please. Ah, you saw it. That's it. Stop. Uh -huh. Just this. You know what's the magic? They talk, blah, blah, blah. Then at the precisely the moment when there is erotic tension contact, the phone rings to interrupt it. And who it is? Her husband, of course. I think that, again, the only way to account for it is to read it as a to read it uh, as a fantasy. So, okay, we have this tension between fantasy, reality, of course, reality sustained by fantasy. But now, to approach slowly, not quite yet, but slowly, the end, uh, I would like to make a step further here. Uh, what characterizes so-called modern cinema, in contrast to Hitchcock, is, I think, precisely the step into the disintegration of fantasy. What do I mean by this? I don't mean uh, disintegration of fantasy in the simple sense of, oh, fantasy falls apart and finally we are welcome to the desert of the real, confronted with the way reality really is. No, it's that interspace where by losing fantasy, by being deprived of fantasy, we lose also reality. And we have some kind of, how should I call it, pre-fantasmatic imaginary, partial objects floating around, not yet a consistent fantasy. This is how I read, and the reason I relatively like, relatively not absolutely, David Lynch's Mulholland Drive. Basically, the movie is, as it is the problem with last Lynch's, I claim, quite the opposite of what is usually said. Oh, it's just a confused story, no meaning. No, it's even too linear. It's too simple a movie. It's clearly that the first two thirds is the fantasy universe and then return to fall back into reality. But I think that the, the structure is properly Lacanian, more complex. It's not direct fall from fantasy, what the girl is dreaming about, played by Naomi Watts, to reality. It's that fantasy, when it gets too intense, precisely after her wonderfully shot, I claim, lesbian lovemaking encounter, gets too intense and starts to fall apart. At that point, she escapes into reality. 
this takes this falling apart of fantasy takes place it's it done in a wonderfully precise way if you saw the movie Mulholland Drive in two steps first it's that that test shooting scene which is you can understand there why Lacan says that uh, repeats after Freud that uh, the real appears as dream within a dream we are in a movie but we get a dimension of her real character of the girl precisely when she makes a test, when she acts within acting movie. You remember how up to that point she's perceived as rather restrained uh, and so on, and all of a sudden you have this explosive of almost obscene erotic energy. Then, but this is still within narrative reality, just too much intensity. Then it explodes in the famous wonderful scene in the nightclub Silencio, you remember where the two girls, Betty, the heroine, and her mistress, lesbian mistress, Rita, go after successfully making love. There is a singer singing Roy Orbison's Crying in Spanish. Then the singer collapses, but the voice remains. The song goes on. This is, again, the autonomized spectral object. And I think this moment is crucial, where fantasy collapses, not into reality, but explodes, gets autonomized, a pure spectral apparition, for example, of a bodiless, undead voice. And uh, I cannot think here about two other examples which point in the same direction. One is, but you must see the long version, four hours. In the short version, it's uh, precisely this scene is cut short, horrible. At, at the very beginning of Sergio Leone's Once Upon a Time in America, you remember the phone ringing, 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 then the hand picks up picks it up, the ringing goes on. Now, what's crucial here is that it's the same as with that scene in a restaurant when Scotty sees Lady in Grey. Of course, immediately afterwards, it is explained in the terms of simple reality what really happened. It is explained. Uh, that is to say, the ringing we were hearing all the time was not that phone ringing, but another ring. But what interests me is those magic five, ten seconds where we think, oh my God, it's something appears, something traumatic. It happened to a good friend of mine. I can even tell you who she would love it. My Stalinist Lacanian colleague, Alenka Zupancic, the magic experience like that. She was, oh, this is a nice dirty private story, but respectable. She was with her boyfriend in a car. Then she was talking to her. And then all of a sudden her mobile phone started ringing. She saw her boyfriend was calling her from the number. And she had this momentary loss of, like, how can he be calling to me when he is there? Okay, after thinking about it, it was explained away. It was simply that she had her mobile phone in such a position here that, you know, her boyfriend's number was, of course, number one, the first. So, you know, she, without knowing it, pressed the buttons and, uh, uh, and it called him. Yes, sorry. So, 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 it was possible to explain it, but she told me nonetheless, for five, ten seconds, it was this uncanny anxiety. What is going on? You can explain, you can explain it away afterwards. But the, here, the other scene, the, as it were, the absolute appears. So, uh, in the, it's the same with Sergio Leone. Again, of course, it's immediately explained then narratively. But nonetheless, those minutes when the phone goes on ringing, where we have precisely what? And here I combine Lacan and Deleuze. It's like the Cheshire cat in Alice, big reference of Deleuze in the logic of sense. You know, when the cat disappears, the smile remains. Organ without a body exists. Uh, there is, of course, here we have the voice which exists. Maybe it's even more horrible what George Balancing did with the piece by Weberen. He staged a ballet based on the music of Weberen. If you know anything about Anton Weberen, you know that his complete works are less than three CDs. That is to say, his pieces if they are very long, are more than five minutes, no? So what balancing this is something ingenious. Dancer dance, the music stops, and the dancing goes on. And the effect is absolutely for it. All of a sudden, it becomes some kind of a dance, you know, as if dancers, as if the dancers were deprived of their life substance. It's as if death itself is dancing. So what interests me, again, is this moment of, of uh, autonomization. This notion of a partial object which starts to talk is also the site of forceful ideological investments, especially with regard to the way the male gaze endeavors to counter the fundamental hystericity of the feminine speech. 
For example, in his extraordinary philosophical novel, Le Bijou Indiscret, the Indiscret Jewels, from 1748, Denis Diderot renders the ultimate phantasmatic answer. His idea here is that a woman speaks with two voices. The first one, that of her soul, mind and heart, is constitutively lying, deceiving, covering up her promiscuity. It is only the second voice, that of her bijou, the pearl, which of course is, he makes it clear, vagina, which by definition always speaks the truth, a boring, repetitive, automatic, mechanical truth, the truth of her unconstrained voluptuousness. This notion of the talking vagina is not meant, that's the madness of it. It's interesting to read the sexual fantasies of so-called French mechanical materialism. He does not mean it as a metaphor, but quite literally. Diderot provides the anatomic description of his words, vagina as, instrument à corde et avant, wind instrument and string instrument, able to sing and so on and so on. So it's as if, again, counteracting what Lacan calls woman doesn't exist, is that there you have the guarantee. When vagina talks, woman does exist positively, not just with the elusive hysterical subject. Does, however, this mean that the talking vagina is just uh, the ultimate male chauvinist sexual ideological fantasy? I think that there is more in it. I think that we should be here very precise. What we have here is not, is not the same as what you have in uh, like the, the recent big uh, theatrical hit, Eve Elsner's The Vagina Monologues. Because now the difference here is very refined one. There, I think, vagina is simply subjectivized. You have a witty, cynical, acerbic voice commenting on and so on and so on. But what Diderot is trying to grasp is something much more uncanny and mysterious. It's a kind of a headless, headless voice of it's not the subject who speaks, it's the object itself which starts to talk in a way. It's a much more uncanny move, this autonomization or the becoming subject directly of the object itself. Along the same lines, I think, we should also read films like the ones that I like at least, uh, uh, the first one I like, David Fincher's Fight Club or the one that I like less, but it has a nice detail the one with, with Jim Carrey, my God, me, myself, and Irene, where in both of them, you know, it's a double, but the double is basically this autonomized object. You remember this crucial, very depressive, traumatic, but I think very effective scene in David Fincher's Fight Club when, when he, the hero, Ed Norton, confronts his boss, he starts to beat himself. But how? It's his fist starts to behave like precisely like autonomous organ without a body acting on its own you remember there is of course something comical about it because you remember this is one of the standard numbers of the circus clowns you know like you behave as if your limbs that you cannot control them that they that they act on their own and of course we can go all on here for example up to the uh, the lesbian ideal which you find is some hardcore porno where you have a group orgy where basically instead of objects, sorry, instead of bodies, you basically have just an assemblage, uh, composition, bricolage of partial objects. Like, you know, when you have a good orgy scene, and they're difficult to find, it's no longer persons. It's just an opening here, an organ there, vagina and a mouth here, penis and another hole there, and so on. All, the unity is lost. This will be, I think, something very Deleuzean. Okay, then... What is so good, so progressive, whatever, about this self-beating in Fight Club? I think that Nietzsche was right when, in one of his fragments, he wrote, and this is for me the best comment on Fight Club. First, one has the difficulty of emancipating oneself from one's chains, and ultimately one has to emancipate oneself from this emancipation too. Each of us has to suffer, though in greatly different ways, from the chain sickness, even after he has broken the chains. So in other words, liberation is first, you have to beat yourself, to get rid of that, as Lacan would have put it, the surplus enjoyment with which master, your master pays you. That's the difficult part of, of liberating yourself. And my final point here would have been 
Now I'm really concluding the po political one. It's that uh, against all this old rhetoric, which is now in some circles at least fashionable again of uh, alienation and against it asserting the wholeness of a person, realizing yourself and so on and so on. The best metaphor for resisting, to use the old fashioned term, revolutionary subject is precisely subject whose objective correlative, whose, who as object is not the whole body, the whole person, but just an organ. Let me now really finish with, I will read you an entire fairy tale, but don't be afraid, it's less than 10 lines. It's the shortest fairy tale of Green Brothers, called The Willful Child, or The Obstinate Child, or different translations, Eigen Zinnige Kind, the German title. Here it is. Once upon a time, there was a child who was willful and did, did not do what his mother wanted. For this reason, God was displeased with him and caused him to become ill. And no doctor could help him, and in a short time, he lay on his deathbed. He was lowered into a grave and covered with earth. But his little arm suddenly came forth and reached up. And it didn't help when they put it back in and put fresh earth over it, for the little arm always came out again. So the mother herself had to go to the grave and beat the little arm with a switch, and as soon as she had done that, it withdrew, and the child finally came to rest beneath the earth. I think this is a very sad story, because I think that this is the best metaphor of resistance. Like, you all know probably all the uh, cinematic connotations of it, from the bad, ironic one, for example, Stanley Kubrick, is it Kubrick? Yes. Strange Love, you remember the Kissinger guy. You know, it was like in this slightly different raising of the hand, repeating. And then, of course, it's uh, Carrie, the first big hit, uh, Stephen King cinema version. You remember when that very last scene, which is already the dream of the other girl, uh, her friend Carrie, you remember how out of the grave the hand comes up. And this is crucial. I think that the moment of, the proper moment of subjectivization, not only in this pathetic sense, revolutionary, but subversive, is precisely when, how should I put it, the object, what we perceive as something non-subjectivable, the object, as it were, starts, becomes a strange non-subjectivized subject, uh, how should I put it? So my point would have been that whenever we have the reference to the whole body, a person, this would be the Lacanian point, this is how I read Lacan's the bar subject confronted with uh, the object small a, that the objective correlate of a person is the whole body. Persons have bodies, corporate bodies, and so on. Subjects are organs. That is to say, how do you become a subject? When precisely as in the fight club, some part of your body, an organ, starts to act as organ without a body. And we should Far from criticizing this as alienation or whatever or forever, we should precisely endorse this opposition. As you know, maybe better than me, always the, ref the fundamental reference of conservative politics is always the corporate one. It's always society as a harmonious body. Then bad things happen when an organ of the body no longer functions in a proper way, doing what it should with regard to its function, as they put it. The head should be a head, king should be a wise king, the hand should be a hand, workers should work, not complain, and so on and so on. But I think, again, the metaphor of emancipation is simply this horror when an object starts to act of its, of its own. And this is the subject in the modern sense. This object, out of joint, as it were, displaced object is the correlate of Cartesian subjectivity. You don't believe me, just to finish, really to finish. Recently, I was rereading uh, Descartes' discourse on method. And I more than ever confirmed in the fact that multiculturalism is strictly a Cartesian affair. My God, you know how it begins, just read it. it what is the opening gesture of Descartes? He says he was traveling around European countries and he says he was first shocked by the difference of customs, opinions, and so on. And then his second move, he says, is that he all of a sudden perceives that, wait a minute, they, they, customs of other people, they may appear strange, eccentric to us, 
But if you look through their eyes at us, we are no better. That's, you know, this fundamental insight into how our own background is ultimately contingent, stupid, and so on. That the same, the same surprise with which you look at others, at other customs, how is it that they eat like that, and so on. That you should be able to, in a kind of a parallax view, shift to adopt the same attitude back towards yourself. And I think this is the original side of Cartesian subjectivity. All that comes afterwards, all this self-identical rational subject, that comes afterwards. The original insight is this radical out of place. I am nowhere. I have no place, which means precisely I have no body, just an organ. I'm sorry if I was too long, but that's life. That's why my friends call me Fidel. Thanks very much. Okay. Let us all thank to the to the guys there because you know they did a wonderful job. I was absolutely sure that something will go wrong with projections and it didn't. That was a wonder because you know it already happened to me that everything was clear. But then the guy, this happened in, in Austria once, the guy screwed it up and it was very embarrassing because I was talking about suffering and death and then there was a scene from Chaplin kicking a dog and so on. So <laughs> this time it worked. Thank you. I mean, okay. I don't know. I did that. Yeah. <laughs> I just thought that would go down rather well in Austria. Uh, <laughs> okay, so the question. Sorry, why? Yeah, but I think, no, 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 I, 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 I know. But I think they, their answer would have been that uh, the woman, it's like kind of a last fetishist step. That is to say, even in the Hollywood of the 50s, in film noir, if you know, the woman taking down her stockings was the most you can see. That was still... Like, you can see a woman taking down her stockings. You cannot see a woman taking down her bra or pants or whatever, no? So I think that she simply went as far as possible because it's interesting for the same problem in next film, Psycho, as you probably know. The other big censorship point where Hitchcock had to fight was, uh, you remember, in the very first scene in the hotel room, uh, you see her, that is to say, Marion, Janet Lee on the bed, and the American ambassador to Mexico, ex, that, is to say, uh, uh, that is to say John Gavin, uh, uh, Sam, you see him standing. And if I remember correctly, he has, he has some underwear on. No? Hitchcock wanted him naked above the waist, at least they didn't want it. And they also insisted, Hitchcock wanted both of them lying down. They, no, he had to stand up. And it's, again, it's absolutely crazy how they reason. Their reason was, no, that's the mystery of Sandra, whom they were trying to convince. I mean, we all knew this was this kind of a, how do you call it, lunch with you, what would be the vulgar term. But they, the arguing of the, the argument of the censors was that there should be a possibility to explain it away that it didn't happen, the sex act. So the, the, the idea was, it's madness, I read it in a book on Hitchcock. What if what happened is just that uh, Janet Lee, Marion, was tired and laid down, and he just came to visit her, and it was caught and put the shirt down. But you see the madness. Nobody thinks this, but they just wanted a purely possible narrative to account for what you see without, without actually... And, some, and obviously there is something in Americans, although I don't want to be uh, engaged in America bashing, which pushes them into this madness. You know, where I myself uh, experienced this total madness quite recently, I uh, visited US, and I noticed uh, when I visit US, usually, as you gently reminded me, I travel like crazy, so I often have that crucial one way tickets, you know. So then I noticed that uh, I'm often twice checked up, you know, once you are, when you pass those blah, 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 and then selectively some passengers are, are checked up again uh, for bombs, whatever, all the luggage immediately before boarding the plane. Then once I exploded and I said, well, what is going on? It's all the time me. Do I look as a 
Okay, do maybe, I don't know, it's a terrorist or what, no? And then it was explained to me, no, it's because you have a one-way ticket. Then maybe you can help me here. I tried to account for it, like what is the reasoning behind it? And maybe I'm stupid, but the only line of reasoning that I was able to reconstruct is the following one. They imagined a terror, let's say to be friendly, I'm a terrorist, you are been nothing, no? <laughs> I tell you, okay, you tell me you go there, bomb, kill yourself. Okay, I tell you, okay, and I make, how do you call it, this proposal of expenses, no? Return ticket to New York, then we land there. No, you will die there, you don't need a return ticket. We can economize there, right? I don't know any other reason why why one-way ticket would, would make me would make me suspicious, no? And again, it's repeatedly, whenever I know. Now, in two days, I'm going to the States. I know where well will happen. In Boston, where I live, board the flight too. Again, could you please, sir, step aside? And so on. But again, so you see, that's my point. How, how, how strange the functioning of ideology, especially censorship, is. You know, that it's not our real beliefs to convince us and so on and so on. It's different things. Sorry, did? Yes. Sorry, I, uh, maybe I missed the argument. Uh, uh, what do you mean by this? How do you read this? Yeah, 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 mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yes, I agree with you because I see in this, again, a kind of an even the distant echo of that first profile of Madeleine because it's again, we will not see her directly, but it's all the more present, I mean. But precisely, I think this is crucial for, uh, like, as Lacan, you also know this as well, that precisely fantasy at its most, at its most radical for Lacan is not subjectivized. Fantasy is a subjective. Fantasy is not what you fantasize about. It's precisely, paradoxically, what Freud calls fundamental fantasies for Lacan, what you are precisely unable to directly fantasize about. This is the whole point of, you know, the wonderful short text by Freud, Ein Kind wird geschlagen, <coughs> sight is being beaten, where the fantasy itself, the core, fundamental fantasy, my father is beating me, is precisely something which a Freud fan em not fantasized, fantasized. Uh, <laughs> precisely uh, was never fantasized by the small kid. It's pure, pure presupposition. So in this sense, yes, I agree that when Lacan speaks about the divided subject, I claim, the ultimate division, is precisely between subject and fantasy. It's that the subject is void, voided of fantasy. You cannot bring the two of them together. You cannot have the subject assuming the fantasy. But I mean, wouldn't the old-fashioned interp Freudian interpretation it simply be? Yes, yes, I'm sorry. Just to um, make it clear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Be that the kind of prohibition of representing her underwear uh, can't be done without the positive suggestion that she doesn't wear underwear. Yeah, but well, I see your point, and I agree. <laughs> no, 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 but well, it's not difficult. No, 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 but 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 how do you unite this with the, the with that scene there? Because there, the fact that three minutes after, when she disappears, all those pieces of cloth disappear. Also, this points towards what can even either see some kind of a strange pervert who puts strange objects, who uses strange objects, but. Uh, because I think, and I would not make this interpretation, but the old-fashioned Freudian interpretation would be that now what's, we have what's, particularly, other, no, me, what's, yes. what's particularly scandalous yes. is because in the first half, at some level, uh, Madeline actually functions as his mother. Uh, in, and, and that's taken up also. I mean, when you, when you, when you put the first shot, uh, saying this is not a subjective shot, yes. Uh, and, and of course, that's kind of textually right, but nonetheless, it's the identification with another position. Now, I think it's very interesting that what that position is, is actually very low 
quite low to the ground. That is to say, the subjective shot that's shown comes absolutely uh, from the point of view of the child. And that happened several times in the movie. Yeah, okay, no, no, I didn't okay, you know why? Because I know that you focus mm. your wonderful takes on this, namely uh, this <coughs> formal aspect of how the object A in, sorry, non Freudian, <laughs> non Lacanian jargon, in vertigo is, of course, this pure form, no? Which is repeated at four or five levels. It's first in, 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 during the credits, all those strange look like attractors in chaos theory, all those strange vertigo forms. Then, of course, you have uh, you have on the, that Carlotta Valdez hair, and you have all uh, that the curl of the hair. Then, then you have, of course, the tower, the circular, and then you have the movement of the camera, and even in a way, uh, when he when Scotty follows Madeleine in the first third, you know the way it goes around on, around on the street. So it's as if the same formal pattern persists again and again. And again, at this level, I like very much, although it doesn't quite work, it's too abstract, but nonetheless, there is something to be, namely, François Regnaud, one of the Lacanian gang guys from Paris, did try such a reading, trying to identify all Hitchcock's masterpieces by a certain pure formal model, like Vertigo, this kind of a curved space, uh, psycho, of course, uh, cut lines, north by northwest, this kind of Diagonals, just straight lines crossing each other, and so on and so on. So, uh, so uh, uh, where I agree with you is, you know, which scene is wonderful for me, and I often use it to explain the key, the key, the difference between uh, when I take over Louis Guest, <laughs> two years of gulag and uh, a little bit of uh, confession to do for not fully. I detect sometimes a trace of irony towards Lacan in me. Am I correct? <laughs> No. Oh. This is not sincere. Okay, sorry, but let's go. No, what I mean is that there is, a, doesn't it happen, I think, once when they are embracing, I think this final embrace before they make love, uh, isn't there one when she, sorry, Scott embraces her, Judy, sinks into Madeleine, and then again, camera itself has this circular movement around yes. them, and then isn't it that for a split of a second, she looks back and to check up if the hair is, you know, it is as if I love you, but I have to check it up if the object, which is the cause of me loving mm. you, is still there. Here you have wonderfully stated this idea that, like, you know, love is not direct, that object of love is not the same as the, the, the object of desire. It's not the same as what Lacan, what Lacan calls object cause, the object cause of desire, which is that on account of which I love you. And again, you can hear complicated way in a properly Freudian way this time. I would say wonderfully well. If you read closely Freud, Freud was a genius, I admit it. His theory of melancholy is not what people usually think, which is, uh, uh, I cannot get, which is, to put it in vulgar terms, the stupid doxa is the following one. You lose the object of desire, then mourning means you work through blah, 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 get used to it. Melancholy means you remain attached to it, you don't you remain attached to the lost object. As Freud has a wonderful hint in his trauma and melancholy, morning and melancholy, where he says that on the opposite, melancholy is, to use this term, wonderful term, is a kind of a advance in advance, like the way Bush would say now, preemptive strike, preemptive <laughs> morning. Before, ev before you even lose the object, uh, in reality, you already mourn. It is if I still have you, but I already, you know, that's mel melancholy. And I think this can be perfectly put then in Lacanian terms. What you actually lose in melancholy is not object of desire, but it's the cause of desire. That is to say, I want a woman. Then I get her, she's there, but I, what, you know, like, it's no longer the cause of desire. That which made me desire her is no longer there. So I think uh, that it is, uh, how to put it, uh, it is at this level, I think, that I agree with you that Hitchcock is, uh, to put it, is uh, much more refined than it may than it may appear. Thank you. In the sense of the.
Yeah, but it's a metaphysical construct which is nonetheless operative in our daily lives. I think that a big other is here for us. How otherwise, let me give you another empirical proof of big other. Not that it really exists, but it, it exists as presupposed in our actual intersubjective activity. Uh, of, for example, isn't it that sometimes you find you imagine a situation, unfortunately I did find a couple of times myself in such a situation where some of us engaged there, four or five of us did something horrible, something unpleasant, dirty, whatever, and we know we should talk about it, but none of us wants to approach this topic. And we all know about it, that's crucial. And at the same time, we all know that the others know. But nonetheless, when somebody explicitly said it, it's shattering. Why? We didn't learn anything new. So the big other learned it. In other words, appearances, the, it's the old Hegelian, or even a, in, in a much more naive way, every, every marriage counselor or divorce lawyer knows it. How often you have this fantasy of, oh, if only my wife were to let me go, I would join my mistress and so on. But then, you know, when your wife really kicks you out, it's, you know, like you dream, how should I put it, that often people who secretly have love affairs find it that to publicly acknowledge it, although it's just appearance, can be very traumatic. This is where I see a relative beauty of, for example, Edith Wharton novel, or I only saw the movie, of course, The Age of Innocence. What is so shattering at the end for the hero? That who is innocent? It's the young wife. And at the end, she simply learns that far from being innocent, she knew it all the time about his affair. And this precisely prevents him from joining his love after her death. So the second point I want to emphasize is that, no, I don't think that simply, no, the big other is kind of a proto-totalitarian master. I think um, I would almost say that in the opposite, that in the totalitarian regimes, that the totalitarian regimes are kind of a paranoid replacement for the failure of the, under quotation marks, normal functioning of the big other, which is why, and here I would respectfully disagree with, uh, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with Orwell's description. I think that Orwell missed, he doesn't give, to put it in very naive terms, he does not give a correct description of how Stalinism effectively functions. Because like my source is the book to which I refer in one of my earlier book a lot, uh, for me, the best book on terror, that uh, all Naumo, Getty Naumo, The Road to Terror. And the book by that um, lady who is despised by right wingers and she tries to rehabilitate Stalinism, which is absolutely not true, Sheila Fitzpatrick. Her books on soil. Uh, you know what, what, she, what they depict there? How did it effectively function in Stalinism? The first paradox is that you don't find in Stalinism, you would think it was totalitarian detailed orders, you have to obey it, do it. No, the mystery was that uh, you, it was really Kafkaesque. You got some order from above, but the order was absolutely not fear. For example, even let's take the big examples, collectivization. The only thing that Stalin said was the problem with kulaks as classes should be, as the class should be solved. We should get rid of fools. Now, nobody knew how to interpret this. Does this simply mean we take excessive land from them? Does it mean we take all land from them? Does it mean we exile them? Does it mean we kill them? How do we do it? Do we pay them? No. It's tragic to read how local cadre then phoned up. What does it mean? No answer. What was Stalin's way? An ingenious one. It was that uh, precisely this anxiety provoking situation where you get an order, but it's not clear what this order is, pushes you to excess. And then, paradoxically, the only positive Stalin interventions were always one of moderation. It's the famous essay from 31, Business with Success, where Stalin says, no comrades here, you cannot do it just like that, and so on and so on. It's the same with Bukharin. Stalin let it know in the late 20s, Bukharin looks bad, traitor, without specification. Then, Afraid of being accused of leniency, blah, blah, 
if you look minutes of Politburo and Central Committee, younger guys demanded Arash, kill Bukhari, blah, blah, blah. The all Stalin's interventions were one and the same motive repeated. Come on, we live in a legal state. The, 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 the guilt of Comrade Bukhari is not yet proven. We cannot kill him. You know, this is the masterful way uh, Stalin, Stalin plays. So the mystery is that, and I don't think this dimension is clear in Orwell, that with all the total totalitarianism does not mean you get clear answers, or sorry, orders that you have unconditionally to obey. You get a kind of an unclear but unconditional injunction. And it's up to you, then it's the big hermeneutic problem, which is why then at this level what enters is this famous criminology. All you get from up, up this is the true Kafkaesque situation, are hints. Like, what does it mean if after Stalin says collectivization, there is an article in Pravda about some unrest among peasants in southern Siberia. Does this mean that we should crush it, or does it mean that we shouldn't, you know, like, you must read between the lines these messages and so on and so on. I found this quite extraordinary, how, how it effectively functions. So again, I know I got lost here, sorry. I will conclude now uh, as usual. You will uh, my point is only that, uh, how put it? Uh, totalitarianism is not a simple phenomenon, especially communist totalitarianism. And to add insult to injury, now a really aggressive statement, this is for me the ultimate theoretical fiasco of Frankfurt School. I don't pass, not that they were pro-American and so on, of course they were. I mean, now in new biographies of Adorno, you can read incredible things. Like, you know what was one of the main sources of money for the Frankfurt School in the 50s? Bundeswehr, the German army, and so on. But OK. It's a cheap point. It doesn't matter. What surprises me is the following. Their point was dialectic of enlightenment. How enlightenment turns into blah, blah, blah. But why did they focus so fanatically all, only on fascism? I mean, fascism is a relatively simple phenomenon. Fascists were, to put it very simply, bad guys who planned to do some bad things. And look what a miracle they really did some bad things. I mean, but, and they were directly against enlightenment. Now, how do you, the true problem, precisely for dialectic of enlightenment, should have been Stalinism, where at least at the origin, maybe, let's go, was some kind of emancipatory potential, and it got, if anything, almost even worse. I mean, and isn't it like you don't have not even a good outline of a theory in the entire Frankfurt School? You have Marcuse's book, Soviet Marxism, which is not that, just an analysis of how Khrushchev, blah, blah, functions. You have a little bit here, there, but no, no theory. Isn't this weird? Isn't this very weird? Oh, too long. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <coughs> I think we should take time with maybe one more question. Does uh, one in Maoist way divide itself into two? <laughs> Probably more, actually. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh my God, I was as a left winger. Sorry. I was. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, can I ask my question? Uh, can we regard fantasies as compulsive memories, other than any psychological error? Sorry, are they composite? What kind of memories? Uh, compulsive memories. Compulsive, sorry, yes. Yes. I repeat it. Can we regard fantasies as compulsive memories, yes. other than any psychological evidence? that are inspired by interaction and intercorrelation between reality and memory? Uh, I mean, as to their empirical source, of course, they can be <coughs> considered as compulsive memories. Although my first point would have been, I don't have time to elaborate it now, that you know the term compulsion in psychoanalysis is something more precise. It's not that everything which is simply imposed on you is automatically compulsion. But uh, if we describe fantasies in this way, then I think some dimension, which for me is the fundamental dimension of fantasy, gets lost maybe. Uh, namely, two aspects of fantasy. One, repeated again by Lacan, and you find it already in Freud, which is that uh, fantasy is not opposed to reality. If you, when your fantasy disintegrates, <coughs> you lose the reality. Our sense of reality, in the very simple sense of in our daily interaction, what we experience as reality, has to be sustained 
by a fantasy. When your fantasy disintegrates, you have a loss of reality. So this idea of, oh, now you get rid of fantasies, finally you see reality the way it is. This, I don't think, and secondly, even more important, it's that, uh, like, uh, as we all know from Freud uh, already, fantasy is not simply a such satisfaction, no. It's not, I desire something, I cannot get it, so I fantasize about it. Uh, the problem is, how do I know in the first place what I want? Fantasy literally sets the coordinates of desire. Fantasy tells us what we desire. We don't, it's not predestined by instincts, by nature, what we desire. Now, if we re-paraphrase it this way, and then if we say what we desire is orchestrated by compulsive memories, I found it problematic also in the sense that we would have to specify here also what do you mean by memory? Because you know there is this tension which in German it can be uh, articulated nicely with, it, with these two terms, Erinnerung and Gedächtnis, on which uh, on which on which uh, Kegel Kegel plays. So uh, again, okay, my point would have been, okay, I'm tempted to accept what you said on two conditions: a that the term memory is defined in a very much more precise way, not just what we simply mean by memories like traces and so on and so on. And po second point that the term compulsive is redefined in a way which has nothing to do with what is usually referred to as Zwang's neurosis, as compulsive neurosis and so on and so on. No? So, because of course I see your point, fantasies in a way are, comp are compulsive, compulsive in the way that, how to put it, you don't choose them, you are in them. But nonetheless, you know, the problem is that you don't experience them as compulsive in the same way that obsessional neurotic rituals are perceived as, 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 com as compulsive. What I'm trying here to do is to rehabilitate a certain level of compulsion. I mean, I don't think that, our, that, com that everything that is simply imposed of us is automatically, I don't know, compulsive, pathological, and so on and so on. Because I think that people people who in this radical sense are not ready to subordinate themselves to compulsion in this more elementary sense not only neurotic sense we have a nice name for them they are called psychotics no you know what i mean so that just have to maybe redefine it a little bit so. which may surprise you but i think yes, well, I, okay I a, okay like how it is that it's already over i know this <laughs> <laughs> well may i take this short gap then to uh to say, Slavoj, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, please. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Now, you provoked me to repeat the old joke. I take, I accept this applause because it's not me who matter. I embody here only what is most noble in you. I'm just a modest element and it's gone. You know how the Stalin says. Okay. <laughs>